Hello everyone and welcome. Today we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of heart failure. Heart failure is when the heart is unable to pump blood around the body effectively. So this does not mean that your heart has stopped pumping, it just needs some help. This is a long-term condition that tends to get worse over time. So as time goes by, your heart will slowly get worse at pumping blood around your body. It is a deadly condition and 50% uh, of patients will die in 5 years upon diagnosis of heart failure. Now there are several ways to classify heart failure and the first one we will be talking about is dividing it into systolic and diastolic heart failure. So just to make sure we know what we're talking about here first, um, systole is when the heart muscle contracts and pumps blood from the chambers into the arteries and we can see this in this image so the heart is contracting and pumping blood out then diastole is when the heart muscle relaxes and allows the chambers to fill with blood so in systolic heart failure the heart cannot pump hard enough so it's not pumping that much blood out and this is indicated by an ejection fraction of less than 40% so the ejection fraction is calculated by stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume times 100. So the stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped out of the heart uh, with each contraction, so out of the ventricle. And the end diastolic volume is that total blood volume that is in the ventricle at the end of diastole. So it is essentially the total amount of, amount of blood that fills the ventricles. So in simple terms, the ejection fraction is just that fraction of blood that is ejected from the ventricle during systole. So systolic heart failure is also called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Um, systolic heart failure results from a decreased contractility of the cardiac myocytes and is often due to ischemia uh, or uh, myocardial uh, infarction dilated cardiomyopathy, a condition where the ventricles become dilated and cannot pump blood effectively, and hypertrophy. Now, in diastolic heart failure, the heart can pump, however, it does not fill enough. That is the issue. Here, we will have a preserved ejection fraction. So, this is also called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Since we're going to have a decrease in stroke volume, However, we will also have a decrease in end diastolic volume, so the ejection fraction stays normal. Diastolic heart failure can be visualized by the Frank Starling mechanism. Um, the Frank Starling law states that stroke volume will increase as end diastolic volume increases. So this is due to myocyte stretch causing a more forceful contraction. So in, in uh, easy terms, essentially is the more the heart stretches, the more forceful is the contraction. So if, you, if you're not going to have that much blood filling the heart, you're not going to have a lot of stretch, and so you're not going to pump blood that well, that strongly. And so you have diastolic heart failure. Now, this systolic or diastolic heart failure can affect the left side of the heart or the right side of the heart. And that is another way of dividing heart failure, so into left-sided or right-sided heart failure. Uh, one thing that is important to remember is that the heart chambers work together. So if, for example, the left ventricle cannot pump enough blood, then the right side of the heart will not receive enough blood. And so if you have one area affected, it will most likely affect the other area as well. So left-sided heart failure will often lead to right-sided heart failure and vice versa. So let's talk about left-sided heart failure. This is the most common type of heart failure and also systolic left-sided heart failure is more common than diastolic left-sided heart failure. Now one of the causes for systolic heart failure in the left ventricle is ischemic heart disease. 
So if you have a blockage of the coronary arteries leading to a decreased supply of blood to the myocardium or no blood supply at all, you get cell death and essentially the formation of scar tissue, which will not contract as well as the normal heart. And so you're going to have the impaired contractility there. So we can see here a blockage in the coronary artery. Here's the left interior descending and leading to muscle damage there of this whole region. And um, so this will lead to systolic heart failure. Another cause of systolic heart failure is left ventricular hypertrophy. So if you have an increase in the afterload, which is the pressure that the heart must work against to eject blood during systole, uh, such as, for example, systemic hypertension or aortic stenosis, that ventricle, that left ventricle, needs to work much harder to pump blood. And so you have a consequent hypertrophy, which over time leads to myocyte death, fibrosis, and some degree of inflammation, which in itself already impairs the contractility of that muscle. But also, hypertrophy means there is more tissue, and so a greater demand for oxygen. And since the heart is unable to supply all that tissue, you're going to have a reduced contractility of the left ventricle, and ultimately leading to systolic left-sided heart failure. Another cause for systolic left-sided heart failure is dilated cardiomyopathy. So this is sometimes seen as a compensatory mechanism of the heart to improve its contraction. So if you get decreased contractility of the heart muscle, uh, where stroke volume is decreasing, the heart tries to compensate by dilating the left ventricle and increasing end diastolic volume. So, as we've seen with the Frank Starling mechanism, if you increase the stretch of the heart muscle, uh, you will produce a more forceful contraction. So, by dilating the left ventricle, you get an increase in end diastolic volume, and so you produce a more forceful contraction. And this only works in the short run, because in the long run, uh, long run, sorry, <laughs> the walls become weaker and thinner, and the heart cannot contract appropriately. So you end up with left-sided systolic heart failure. As we can see here in this image, um, so this is a heart with dilated cardiomyopathy. We can see that the left ventricle here is much thinner, so it cannot pump blood effectively. Now, as for diastolic left-sided heart failure, one of the causes is left ventricular hypertrophy. So we mentioned left ventricular hypertrophy as one of the causes for systolic left-sided heart failure. However, it can also lead to diastolic heart failure. So let's say in hypertension and aortic stenosis, like we mentioned, it ultimately leads to ventricular hypertrophy. Now, while it does lead to uh, an increased oxygen demand and in, uh, a poor contractility of that muscle, so systolic heart failure, it also leads to less space in the ventricle for blood. So as you can see here, a hypertrophied left ventricle, there is very little space there for blood, so you don't have appropriate filling. Also, in hypertrophy, we see uh, an impaired ventricular relaxation. So during diastole, the heart cannot fill enough. Uh, so yeah, it, it, ends it ends up leading to a decreased end diastolic volume. And so we get diastolic heart failure. Another cause for diastolic left-sided heart failure is restrictive cardiomyopathy, a condition where the heart muscle gets stiffer and cannot relax appropriately. So if the heart does not pump enough blood to the body, we end up getting a decreased renal perfusion. And so since there is less blood going to the kidneys, we get the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which will ultimately lead to sodium and water retention. This is our body trying to increase that end diastolic volume. So going back to the Frank Starling mechanism, essentially, what our body tries to do is to increase the stretch in the heart muscle to produce a more forceful contraction and make up for 
the lack of blood being pumped uh, in the body. However, over time, this leads to fluid leakage into the tissues. So we got a uh, fluid buildup. And here, as we can see in this image, we get pitting edema. Um, this is seen usually in the legs where fluid pulls down due to gravity. And so it is a, an edema where if you press, you will end up leaving a, a print there in the patient's leg. So another consequence of left-sided heart failure is pulmonary edema. This is also a major sign of heart failure. So if the left ventricle is not pumping enough blood to the aorta, we're gonna get the congestion of blood uh, here because we have blood coming in from the pulmonary veins. And so essentially blood ends up backflowing into the lungs and ends up leaking into the interstitium, into the alveoli. And so we have pulmonary edema. Now, patients with pulmonary edema are going to present difficulty breathing and also orthopnea, which is difficulty breathing when laying down. So uh, when trying to sleep, for example. And this is because when laying down, gravity naturally pulls blood uh, more into our lungs, into our upper body. So here's a, an x-ray showing a patient with pulmonary edema. Now, let's talk about right-sided heart failure. So, often what causes right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. So, like we mentioned before, the congestion of blood into the pulmonary circulation ultimately ends up leading to congestion all the way back here, coming back to the right ventricle, so through the pulmonary arteries. So we get that pulmonary hypertension due to congestion of blood in the pulmonary circulation uh, that is caused by a left-sided heart failure. Now, this pulmonary hypertension means that the right ventricle needs to pump blood uh, more forcefully. So it needs to, it, it increases the workload in the right ventricle. And so you end up with hypertrophy right? Right ventricular hypertrophy. So just to recap there on, on hypertrophy, we know that it will lead to systolic heart failure due to more demand for oxygen. However, it can also lead to diastolic heart failure due to less space for blood. So other causes of right-sided heart failure uh, will be anything that increases the workload of the right ventricles. So atrial or ventricular septal defects for example, our pulmonic valve stenosis will ultimately lead to right ventricular hypertrophy. So here in this image, we have a ventricular septal defect. So we have blood traveling from a higher pressure area into a lower pressure area here. And this uh, blood flowing there from the left to the right ventricle means that the right ventricle will have to pump harder uh, essentially increasing its workload to pump blood to the pulmonary circulation. And then there in pulmonic valve stenosis, it just means that this valve right here is not working appropriately and it will require a greater force to open. Um, another cause of right-sided heart failure is a right ventricular myocardial infarction. So if we have the death of heart tissue here in the right ventricle, we also get that impaired contraction, ultimately leading to systolic heart failure. So next, let's talk about core pulmonale. This is an isolated right-sided heart failure, secondary to chronic lung disease. So if we have COPD, for example, so chronic obstructive lung disease, um, it will lead to a, a chronic hypoxia there in the lungs. And uh, the lungs work a little bit differently. If there is um, hypoxia in certain area of the lungs, you're gonna get a decreased blood supply to that area as we're trying to match ventilation in, and perfusion to maximize gas exchange. So in the lungs, the, area, the areas that are uh, more ventilated will be the areas receiving more blood. 
And so in COPD, we have a chronic hypoxia. And so we have the constriction of pulmonary arterioles. So for example, as seen here. Now this will lead to pulmonary hypertension and an increased workload of the right ventricle. So the right side of the heart needs to pump harder to send blood into that pulmonary circulation and ultimately leads to right-sided heart failure. Now, as of the consequences of right-sided heart failure, so if the right ventricle is not pumping enough blood out, we're gonna have the congestion of blood into the right atrium and the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. And so this will lead to a jugular vein distension as seen in this patient right here. You see the jugular vein here is very prominent and this is indicative of right-sided um, heart failure as we have their congestion of blood in the jugular vein. Also, you can get congestion of blood into the liver and spleen, leading to hepatosplenomegaly, which is the enlargement of the liver and the spleen. And it can be severe enough to lead to cirrhosis. Now, this fluid can also build up in the peritoneal space. This is termed ascites. And naturally, this uh, excess fluid that is uh, being congested will lead to um, ed edema in the legs. Uh, so we have gravity pulling blood into our legs. And this will contribute to that pitting edema that we talked about earlier, which is another major sign of heart failure. So thank you very much for watching. In this video, we discussed systolic, diastolic, left and right-sided heart failure, as well as some of the common signs and symptoms. Uh, I hope this was useful. I hope this helped. Uh, if you enjoyed, please leave a like and subscribe for more.